Good afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to UK Column News. It's Wednesday, the 1st of March, 2017, just after one o'clock. And uh, I'm here with uh, Mike Robinson. We'll also be joined by David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. But we start off with a happy day. Uh, yes, happy St David's Day. Um, well, Theresa May was making some comments about this today. Uh, one in particular that I was uh, interested in in what she said. She said, our precious union is at the heart of everything my government does. And it struck me, Brian, that in light of the fact that uh, we are breaking up the union, we're setting up city regions, George Osborne pushing the Northern Powerhouse, breaking up the union, devolution everywhere, elected mayors. Uh, this can't be the United Kingdom union that she's describing here. This no. has to be some other union. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about which other union she might be talking about. Well, I think it's the um, it's the global elitist union, Mike. I think this is the the pieces of the jigsaw put together by the global banking system, which is going for a rules based international order. I have to admit that wasn't the answer I was expecting. OK, I was expecting the European Union, but there we go. That's just as good. Right. <laughs> Let's move on. OK, uh, reminder of ads. Uh, Gilad Atzman in Glasgow on the uh, 30th of March. Um, tickets available from Eventbrite. David Scott organising this meeting. Do get along to it if you can. Uh, and also tonight, last call for uh, Vanessa Bailey, who is in London at the Marks Memorial Library in Clarkwell Green in London. Uh, starts at 7pm, uh, entitled Aleppo Fall or Liberation. Get along to that if you possibly can. Uh, yes, really excellent. See the truth about uh, Syria and Aleppo beginning to spread. It's clear that more and more people are starting to, uh, to um, um, look at the official version and question it. Mm. So if you can get there, please go. Well, we just bring in this little story from uh, Plymouth Herald, which is uh, very pleased because one of uh, Britain's nuclear attack submarines has come out of refit. And this is a major occasion. Uh, submarine, I think is HMS Trenchant. Now I know a huge amount of work goes into uh, any vessel when it goes in for a major re uh, refit. So credit to all of the teams that have worked for that. But of course the bit we need to highlight is a little while ago, the Telegraph was reporting there were major problems with Brit Britain's attack submarines. We questioned local MP Gary Streeter on it. He wouldn't answer the questions. In fact, he made a personal attack on me to try and deflect from those questions as to the status of our nuclear attack submarines. And I have a little feeling that this uh, article in the paper is, is to try and reassure the uh, public that we now have one that's come out of refit, not yet ready to go to sea, but at least it's out of refit. Mm. Uh, OK, um, Boris Johnson, quite a lot on Boris Johnson today. He is uh, visiting the Ukraine. Uh, with the Polish Foreign Secretary. Um, so he and the Polish Foreign Secretary on a joint trip to the Ukraine. Uh, they're uh, there to represent both countries' unwavering support for Ukraine. Uh, they're going to hold a series of high-level meetings, apparently, with President Poroshenko, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Foreign Minister of Ukraine. And this visit, they say, marks 25 years of diplomatic relations between the UK and Poland with Ukraine, uh, and has nothing at all to do with reinflaming tensions there, Brian. So that's good. Uh, so three years since the start of uh, Russian aggression is what they're saying against Ukraine and its flagrant breach of international law with its illegal annexation of Crimea. So that's what they're there to deal with. Uh, and they fully, fully support Ukraine's sovereignty. Crimea is Ukraine's, sorry, Crimea is Ukraine and Russia must return it is what they're saying. So uh, here's Boris. What did he have to say? I'm delighted to be visiting Ukraine again so soon, and I'm particularly pleased to be joined by Foreign Minister, uh, the Polish Foreign Minister. Poland is close, a close UK partner, and we will work closely on a range of foreign policy issues, including Ukraine. The UK will continue to play a full part in European security questions as we prepare to leave the EU. Uh, this visit reinforces our unwavering support for Ukraine. The UK remains committed to defending Ukraine's sovereignty. We're adamant that Russians' annexation of Crimea is illegal and we urge Russia to, to uh, return it. So there you go. Uh, the Polish foreign minister said Poland and the UK, uh, since the beginning of the revolution of dignity, have supported Ukraine on its pro-European path. And I thought that was quite ironic, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the 
Law and Justice Party that, uh, that he uh, is part of um, are some are pretty Eurosceptic at the moment. Uh, they're having a massive spat with the European Commission over changes to uh, uh, the running of the Polish co Constitutional Court. Um, so they're really only uh, pro-EU when it suits them. Uh, it's only, you know, that's, that's when it suits them. So that's good. Um, and, uh, but I also wanted to highlight this article from Newsweek. Uh, uh, Disbanded Brothers, what happens when Ukraine's foreign fighters return home? Uh, and uh, really the crux of this is about people from other parts of Europe that have gone to the Europe to the Ukraine to fight uh, against the Russians, um, and they're saying they're making the point that seven men were arrested in Spain recently for possession of firearms and explosives, uh, and they say not the sort of foreign fighters Europeans have come to, uh, become accustomed to. Uh, so, in other words, they're not from Syria or Iraq, but they're from Ukraine, and they subheadline this uh, foreign fight foreigner fight club. So, you know what we have in the making here, Brian is. Uh, is another Operation Gladio with people going to Syria, going to uh, Iraq possibly, but also going to Ukraine, uh, getting their training in these countries. Getting the weapons. Getting the weapons, getting the explosives. And of course, they're coming back and being distributed uh, right across Europe. And the point here is um, that while obviously Muslim extremism is, uh, is a problem, it's not just going to be uh, Muslim extremists because we've also got uh, Western extremists who have been fighting in these countries coming back fully equipped. Yeah, and we, we, can, we can say with confidence that everywhere the European Union has gone, we're now seeing trouble, unrest, destabilise countries, and they're pushing for that even more. And we now have, of course, European um, army movements right up onto the Russian borders. We've got NATO pushing in the same direction. Everything here is a destabilizing picture, all based around the fact that the European Union must be in and controlling Europe. Uh, absolutely. Um, now, Boris uh, also pretty upset about this. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, but uh, the UK and, the Fr and France had uh, pushed forward a Security Council resolution, a draft resolution, uh, intended to impose sanctions on the Syrian government over, well, alleged chemi chemical attacks that carried out uh, in 2014 and 2015. Um, and unfortunately, Russia and China both vetoed uh, this Security Council resolution. This was because uh, they had reached the quorum um, in order to pass the resolution. Uh, but of course, the veto overrides that. So uh, alongside Russia and China, Bolivia voted against the resolution. Egypt, Kazakhstan, Ethiopia abstained. Um, the UK in particular were pretty apoplectic about it. Uh, they'd pushed this security resolution uh, to the Security Council in December, but the vote was yesterday. Uh, and uh, they were saying that the basis for, uh, for their resolution was that D Damascus was responsible for uh, three chemical attacks uh, when uh, chlorine was, uh, was dropped. Uh, sorry, uh, David Ellis has just appeared uh, on screen, and although you can't hear him at the moment, uh, we can. So, <laughs> David, if you could just mute for, for uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, right, so before the vote took place, Matthew Rycroft had said this. He said, uh, this council is, is about to be asked a simple question. Will we take action against those who use chemical weapons in Syria? It's that simple. Uh, this isn't about politics, he said. At its core, this isn't really about uh, the gym and the OPCW, forget the acronyms. This isn't even about Syria. This is about taking a stand when children are poisoned. It's that simple. It's about taking a stand when civilians are maimed and murdered with toxic weapons, weapons used to complete, uh, with, uh, in complete disregard for international rules and norms that we all claim to uphold. The hypocrisy in this man's words, I just do not know how he gets them out without simply curling up in a ball and dying. It's incredible. Uh, Boris Johnson had this to say, uh, the Security Council's own investment, uh, sorry, investigation has found attacks were committed by the Syrian regime and Daesh on the Syrian people. Despite support from the majority of the Security Council, Russia, along with China, has chosen to prevent action. Uh, he was pretty upset about it. Can I just make sure we're clear on this? They're, they're talking about using chemical weapons yes. in that statement. Yes. So we come, we come back to the point that uh, the words he's saying is were committed. In fact, there has been no uh, documentary evidence produced which proves that uh, Assad used chemical weapons on his own people. All of the documentary evidence which has come out of the UK, the US 
and the UN and France all said it was a uh, possibility but there was no factual evidence it was the case. Well that's absolutely right and as Vanessa Bailey has pointed out uh, of course the uh, chemical plants that were able to and capable of producing chlorine were all in the hands of ISIS at the time. Yeah. So uh, back to uh, Matthew Rycroft then. Uh, after the vote, he said, I'm appalled that Russia has vetoed this resolution today and I'm surprised and disappointed that China has chosen to join them at complete odds with the principles of non-proliferation that both China and Russia claim to support so strongly. Uh, in, in Security Council Resolution 2118, we all agreed, Russia and China included, that any of the chemical weapons, uh, any use of chemical weapons by anyone in the Syri Syria Arab Republic uh, will lead to the Council imposing measures under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Thanks to those vetoes today, we have failed to do so. Uh, and so it went on. Um, but the United Kingdom will not let Russia's actions today stop us from working with international partners to see justice for the victims and to prevent the use of chemical weapons by anyone anywhere. Well, uh, I think perhaps uh, Matthew Rycroft uh, needs to look in the mirror because, okay, it may not be chemical weapons, but how about cluster bombs in Yemen? How about depleted uranium all over Iraq? We'll come on to that a little later. Well, they don't want to talk. They don't want to talk about that, Mike. That's gently pushed off to one side. Rank hypocrisy, and it doesn't matter what political party. I think that's the thing we're seeing. Absolutely. Um, and just to end this section, then uh, some really good news because Matthew Rycroft is now president of the uh, Security Council for his stint. Uh, particularly fascinating um, image. image in the background there on the wall. Uh, I think Vanessa tweeted out today that uh, the snake has the snake on the wall behind it. We can't, uh, <laughs> can't distinguish yeah. which is which. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is remarkable. We've got a sort of mythical snaky-like creature which has stabbed itself with a sword. It's all very dark, of course. And top left, we've got a boot which is actually standing on part of the tail. So th this is this is in the the one of the UN committee rooms. Well, presumably. that's the Security Council. Security Council yeah, room. Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, I'm sure that dark arts is what we're looking at, probably. Um, David Ellis has joined us now. Um, maybe putting you on the spot here, David. But have you any thoughts about uh, what we've just been covering? Yeah, I have. It, it, it doesn't sound good. It's not diplomatic language that that I recognise, and he's it, it, he's seems to be very very harsh. So. With the things that he's saying, it, I, you know, I just frankly don't see how this is helpful. Um, and I and I'm really with um, some of the lords that I've been dealing with on this. And we really should have years ago put our arms around as a nation and diplomatically around Russia, and we could have averted all of this problem. But we are where we are now, thanks to our leadership, uh, concurrent leadership. So we've really got to start, you know, having some sensible counsel here. Otherwise, we're going to get bounced into situations that we really don't want to get bounced into. And that's the danger at the moment. But I, I'm, I'm quite, quite in agreement that that um, whatever it is that he's, that, that's the backdrop, you know, it doesn't look good at all, does it? I mean, it's not. It's not uplifting. It's dark, isn't it? It really is. It's dark. So, yeah, that needs um, that needs that needs sorting out, surely. Um, well, let's just uh, remind ourselves about how the pressure is being kept on Russia, aside from uh, comments like those from Matthew Rycroft and Boris Johnson. Uh, we've got the four multinational battle groups, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. We were talking about this a couple of days ago. And of course, uh, lots of EU involvement in that. We'll come on to that in a second. Uh, but uh, the continuing fake news stories, uh, just incredible. This uh, it, headline here, is Russian is Russia behind a cessation effort in California? Is there anything that the mainstream media is not going to attempt to blame on Russia? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can we say? Uh, well, we better bring in Chris Bryant at this point uh, because a little while ago we challenged him about uh, evidence. He said there was clear evidence, clear evidence that Russia was getting involved in. Uh, um, elections in France, in America, uh, in Germany and uh, UK. Uh, this then spread across the media. So we've got the Guardian Centre, senior British politicians targeted by the Kremlin for smear campaigns. This is Chris Bryant again. He's obviously in pink news, clear evidence Russia hacked British elections, clear evidence and clear evidence reported in the um, I think that's the independent there over on the left. 
Um, evening standard here, clear evidence Russia interfered directly in UK elections, claims former Labour minister. And uh, we had this bit here. Chris Bryant, the former Europe minister, uh, told Parliament he thought top-level decisions made on UK security issues had also been compromised by Russian infiltration. So we've got a politician simply standing up and saying that uh, there's clear evidence. We've asked him about that. We've had no response. So I'm going to ask at this point, is this man just ignorant? Do you think, uh, Mike, is he being deceived or is he simply lying or is he deliberately pushing out fake news? That's a good question. But of course, uh, some of the comments he made suggested that he was being fed this information by a, t by a Times journalist. Yeah, he's being fed it by a Times journalist and we track part of it back uh, to one um, social media. This was the original uh, tweet we put out. So Ron De Bryant, let the public see your evidence. First day of asking the 22nd of February. Uh, well, here we are, 1st of uh, March. We've still got no evidence. We did bet him a new pair of Y fronts. Um, we did buy them. We've got them ready to send, but we've had nothing back. But this is what we discovered that we followed through the pathetic report in the paper, the BBC also on this, and they're saying all the information came from this one uh, social media blogger who eventually contacted me. He said, uh, this, this is glasnost gone. This is the source of the evidence that the Russians are hacking our elections, for, according to the papers anyway. For me, <clears throat> the man is saying, for me, the issue is fake Twitter accounts tweeting misinformation against hashtag Ukraine or leave our national security to others. Now, I find this very interesting because the fact he says I'll leave our national security to others tends to indicate he's he's at least living in this country and feels part of the part of society in this country. Or is he in fact security services or he's security services. But um, this is apparently the source of the of the evidence. So here we are. It's day eight and we've still not got no evidence against the Russians from Chris Bryant MP. Um, David, we've got to the stage where our MPs are either just blatantly lying to the public or they're deliberately deceiving them or they're stoking up fake news or else they've suddenly become ignorant and unable to question uh, what's happening around there. Uh, I can't work out what it is at the moment. I certainly can't with Chris Bryant. What's your take on the mental well, uh, acumen uh, uh, of our uh, MPs? Well, Brian, we're we're in we're in crisis. Then you know, if a, if a guy of your caliber can't work out what's what's what here, you know, the nation's in trouble. Frankly, you know, uh, just well, I mean, it, what's going on? Is this guy expressing a, a private opinion? You know, in which case he's he's he, you know it's okay to do that, but his language isn't isn't right. You know. Don't say that there's evidence and then don't produce any. Um, you know, express your opinion if you don't like Russia or fine or, or like them, don't like them, whatever. But, you know, this really isn't on because, you know, this this the, the, the capability of what and, and the things that are being talked about, spoken about and debated in Parliament should be of a high, far higher calibre and level than this. You know, it's just not becoming. Yeah, that's a gentleman's analysis, I have to say, David. Thank you for that. <laughs> OK, um, Ministry of Defence pushed out... Uh, a little propaganda video this morning. Uh, they're saying on the 9th of March, HM Queen uh, will unveil the Iraq and Afghanistan Memorial honoring the service of both UK armed forces and civilians. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the video playing. They're gonna recognize the duty and service of all UK armed forces and UK civilians. Uh, and we've got lots of uh, fantastic imagery here. Uh, they've all been putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, they're protecting our national interests. Well, did it? Or did it protect the interests of uh, the banking elites? It helped those in danger, did it? 56,000 tonnes of ordnance dropped, uh, much of it di distributing depleted uranium everywhere. Uh, how many people did this put in danger and how many babies were deformed as a result? How many deaths? Uh, they apparently worked to, to improve lives. And so the question is, has it improved the lives of civilians in Mosul? Is it improving the lives of, of people in, in Iraq in general? Uh, of course, we're rebuilding villages, uh, championing democracy. We're pushing forward with healthcare and education. This is fantastic stuff. Um, and between 1990 and 2015, that was over 300,000 UK service personnel deployed to Iraq to make people's lives better there. 
and what a success that has been. Uh, of course, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that statistic is beautifully crafted, Mike, 300,000. To get that number that large, that includes people who've returned to to, to Iraq because we, we haven't got military forces at that scale. No, no but that's civilians as well, of course. Oh, so, oh sorry, sorry. The in military words, is private, now civilians. Yeah, yeah. yeah private contractors and in, in, right. in amongst that lot as well. Now, of course, the price that, uh, that uh, Iraqis have paid has been covered by uh, Felicity Arboth Arbothnot for uh, many years now. Uh, particularly on the DU um, issue. And it wasn't just about Iraq. It's, this memorial is also about Afghanistan. And what have we done there? Well, of course, we, are, we have turned Afghanistan into uh, a drug-growing country. That's all it does. Production up 10% uh, since 2015. These are 2016 statistics. Eradication down 91%. So we're doing a really fantastic job in that country to make sure that its, uh, its priorities are correct. Average yield up of uh, opium poppies up 30% 2015. And of course, this isn't just affecting people in Afghanistan. This is affecting people in Britain and people in the United States who are the recipients of the heroin that's being grown as a result. You know, Afghanis can't make enough money through farming, they have to grow opium. So this is, uh, this is what we've done to these two countries. So I've got to say well done uh, and thank Her Majesty for unveiling this memorial when she does. Uh, she, we should all be very proud of it. I'll keep silent at that point, Mike, because I, I don't feel proud at all as time goes on, actually. I feel disgusted with what I'm witnessing uh, UK do uh, in the name of the UK government, not in the name of the general public. Um, David, it's getting clearer and clearer. We, we are the ones who are destabilising these countries and breaking them down. Um, making a bit of money from drugs seems to fit in with a very old story that many people have told about the role of um, British intelligence services and the CIA and drugs and guns. Well, it's, it, I mean, there's two things you can say here safely that, you know, the, the, the war was fabricated, the conflict was fabricated. And we, and we can, you know, you can safely say now that the region is completely in chaos. So, you know, that then beggars more questions. But, you know, this is not news to us as a nation. We've known about the, the opium and the drugs in Afghanistan for, you know, hundreds of years. This is not this is not news to us. You know, we went through a you know, quite a period in the Victorian ages with this. So, you know. Uh, well, well, that's if, that's right, David. But of course, uh, in 2001, just prior to us uh, moving back into Afghanistan, uh, the, the drug uh, car the drug situation had been stopped in that country. We went back and restarted it again. That, that's the key point here. As a result, as you rightly say, of an illegal war in in Iraq, uh, possibly an illegal war in Afghanistan. That's been the result. And that's that's the point that I want to keep uh, making because because this is the point that a lot of people still haven't quite grasped. This is all happening as a result of our actions and it's actually impacting on our lives as well as those in, in those countries. Yeah, you're quite right. You can't argue the drug production has gone up subsequent to the conflict, you know, that, that's that's, you know, and that's even by the, you know, the figures that are available. So coming back to the memorial, you know, is, is Tony Blair's head going to be on the top of it? One you know, would, that's, that's, that's one my would hope so. On a spike? One would hope so. <laughs> that's brought a smile to our faces. That is a good mental image. Yes. Uh, thank you for that, David. Well, look, if the government uh, is worried it hasn't quite got its message out, what you have to do is ramp up the message and make it even more fearsome. So this is British Defence Secretary Michael Fallon. He says, be afraid it's now, it's not just terrorism, Mike. Ah. It's not terrifying terrorism or very terrifying. It's now brutal terrorism. And so you wonder what has caused the problem. Why have we escalated the terror of the terrorist threat and terrorism to brutal? It's because uh, those nasty jihadists have decided to use drones to sort of drop a hand grenade. Obviously, that's dangerous. It could just hit you on the head. I'm making light of a very serious subject, but let's get real about this. This is the British government suddenly saying that the ability of somebody to drop a fairly small explosive from a pretty crude drone is it's thrown us into confusion, Mike. Yes, it's uh, brutal. Uh, if we just put this in context, Brian, 56,000 tonnes of ordnance dropped in Iraq in the first Gulf War. Yes. That's more than was dropped and in the Second World War. These people are trying to defend themselves by using the high-tech they can get hold of little toy drones 
and this has sent Michael Fallon into a spin. Let's, let's have a look at what this is about. Drone versus drone, UK develops new ro remote control weapons that will be able to shoot down jihadis aircraft. This is something out of Winnie the Pooh manual of warfare. It's quite astonishing. Let's have a look at this. Uh, he says, well, he's very excited about drone helicopters because this is the defense secretary speaking. They can hover over particular areas in a way that the Reaper drone would only be able to go around in circles. Ah. This is really astonishing information. You can do, uh, uh, you can do what a helicopter can do that a plane can't do. The payload is obviously an interesting one. Will we be able to fly stuff in without a pilot? So Michael Fallon, we're going to come on to his experience, is, is getting really, really very worried about brutal terrorists who are able to take what is essentially a toy and drop a hand grenade. Yeah. And as you've said, 56,000 tonnes, was it? Yeah. We've, we've dumped on the country. Uh, so he goes on, he says that Islamic State terror group's latest drone tactics in Iraq, in which they drop grenades from the skies, have been a wake-up call for Britain. We are one of the world's um, top nations. We're one of the most advanced military, and we are shocked to discover that people can drop hand grenades from toy aircraft. I'm just going to pause there because it, it makes you want to weep. It says, drone wars of the future. Uh, science fiction will soon be science fact. Unmanned warfare is coming, absolutely, says Michael Fallon. And he drones on. Daesh is developing drones. We've seen them defending Mosul with drone attacks. It was a good example of what Britain's enemies were up to, adding, we simply have to keep ahead. And um, if we just, I just want to skip over one, if I may, we'll come off this one and onto this one. Here we are, space like cyber is the next domain. And our adversaries are already looking at how they can compete against us in space. And we have to be ready for that. Other countries are investing very heavily in space and they're putting satellites up with military applications. This is remarkable. I can go back to the beginning of the 1970s. I can't even remember how many years that is ago. And we had military, uh, we had military satellites. Satellites were scanning, uh, detecting things, spying, intercepting communications. But Michael Fallon has suddenly woken up to the fact that there may be rockets and satellites in space. Super. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? What we got here, uh, well, he reveals more. The minister revealed the military has formed a Dragon's Den style panel to research and develop weapons. So don't worry about the brutal terrorism, Mike, because we're going to create a Dragon's Den to combat it. And he said that the Ministry of Defence has to keep ahead by recruiting world experts, uh, experts such as outgoing GCHQ boss Robert Hannigan. Now, just to put this in context before we discuss a little bit, uh, well done the mail, and here's the lady journalist who actually uh, put this story across. So here's the dragon, um, uh, there's the dragon's den. We've got links into GCHQ. Uh, I'm not making this up. Now, this is one of the key people, Major Tim Peake, who was Britain's, Britain's first astronaut. He's uh, become the expert on on warfare in space. Well, I'm surprised um, James Dyson isn't on this, and then we could have just sucked those drones, drones out of the sky. We could have done. Uh, we could have done. Uh, we've got uh, racing cars, though. Ron Dennis, the former chair of McLaren, uh, the racing car technology group. He's he's involved in the Dragon's Den, which is going to save us from brutal terrorist drones. I don't know how to keep a straight face at the moment. Uh, we've got an unknown group of experts from Oxford University. Uh, we've got Michael Fallon. Now, his expertise is on the button. Classics, ancient history, master of arts, and he's very big on children's nurseries. Yes. So presumably he could be earning a little bit of money from uh, children from Iraq. Uh, but not to worry, because the former F1 team boss, Mr. Dennis, said it was in, in the panel's DNA to win, and they were all fiercely patriotic. Good. i pause there. David... I've used the term La La Land a couple of times, actually, in recent days. I do not know how, uh, how else to describe this utter, utter nonsense which is being pushed at the general public. Um, the Mail has done no proper investigative reporting challenging what's going on here. This is utter drivel.
or am I being hard? No, probably not hard enough. Uh, I can, you know, I, I completely concur. Where's Mike Fallon going with this? Uh, is he acting under his own steam or is he acting uh, with an entourage in this fashion? Um, well, my opinion is, uh, my opinion is, as it stands, he and his entourage, if that's the case, have got to go. And I'm backed up by that, by that opinion, by judiciary that are speaking to me, by senior officers that are speaking to me. And I've even heard senior backbench Tory MPs saying it. The guy has got to go. I mean, frankly, he really is at the moment looking at the actual state of our armed services and the industry and all those people, all those good folks in our nation where they work in this in this arena of manufacturing and engineering. Uh, you know, he is at the moment making uh, Jack Perfumo look like a saint. You know, he really is. It is untenable. It's absolutely untenable looking at the global picture, looking at the, the current status of the defence spending that's going to go on and the business that's got to be done and where we are with our own military, which is, you know, frankly, under, under his leadership now in utter chaos. Well, utter chaos is the right word, uh, David. Isn't it interesting that we don't get any comment from any senior officers anymore, serving senior officers? They've now become puppets of this man. Uh, I think this is the most dangerous individual probably we've got in the government. Theresa May is not holding uh, Michael Fallon to account. This man is off on his own agenda. And if we just want to emphasise how bad things have got, We've got brutal terror, which we would have thought GCHQ would be monitoring. What's GCHQ up to? Well, have a look at their website. They're now producing puzzles for charity, and they, they're very proud to have produced their first ever puzzle book. This is Alice in Wonderland stuff. This is somebody at the back of government making a complete mockery of this nation, and it's accelerating and until we get rid of these people from Parliament in an appropriate way, um, we, we are getting into a very dangerous world here. Um, I think I'd better leave my comment on that, Mike. I don't know whether you can add something, but what do you say? This is just astonishing. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the Russians, Chinese make of it. Yeah. OK, um, European Union. Now, this, this is uh, interesting, the developments here, because, of course, European Union are they in a state of collapse? They're certainly in a state of chaos. They don't know which way to go. Uh, and uh, we had this report from uh, from Sputnik a, a week or so ago saying that Germany, Italy, France, Luxembourg are wanting to uh, get together and create a fully federalized, fully federal United States of uh, Europe. They want to go ahead. There, this is this two-tier two Europe that everybody's talking about. Uh, there was an open letter published uh, which said it's high time to move towards closer political integration, the federal union of states within broad powers. Uh, we know that such an initiative triggers a strong resistance, but some, uh, but someone, uh, but inactivity cannot become paralysis for everyone. Those who believe in European ideals should be able to give them a new life instead of help, helpfully, sorry, helplessly observing its slow sunset. Now, the, this open letter was published, uh, and then there, there will be a meeting of the uh, heads of the European Parliament uh, in mid to late March. Uh, I've seen different dates for this from different newspapers. Sputnik said the 17th. I think the Telegraph said the 25th. Uh, and this apparently is going to discuss, uh, well, the Telegraph published it today, Jean-Claude Juncker's new five pathways to unity, oh. which they're describing as a blueprint for the future of Europe after Brexit. Uh, and the Telegraph seems to be the first uh, newspaper or news outlet which has uh, seen this document. It certainly doesn't seem to have been published officially yet, so perhaps we've got to take this slightly with a pinch of salt. Uh, but what they're saying is, uh, what they're listing here is five scenarios. Uh, the first one is to just simply carry on. Uh, they're saying that Juncker notes that uh, the speed of EU decision-making depends on overcoming differences of views in order to deliver on collective long-term priorities. Uh, and that so uh, carrying on is inefficient, although the unity of the 27 is preserved. Uh, the second scenario is that there would be nothing but the single market, so they give up on issues such as migration, security, or defense, uh, and that they uh, shrink the regulatory burden, burden sorry, by dropping, well, this is his proposal, dropping two pieces of legislation for every one that gets passed in the future. 
Uh, scenario three is uh, those who want more do more. So this is the two tier system where uh, one or more coalitions of the willing are created to drive forward specific areas such as defense, internal security, taxation, or social policy. Uh, the fourth option is to do less, uh, but do it more efficiently. Uh, and so they're saying that as a result, uh, the EU would be able to act much quicker and more decisively. I don't think that's a very likely scenario. Scenario five, doing much more together. And in this one, he's saying that the EU 27 would decide to share more power resources and decision making across the board. And that would mean that by 2025, internationally, Europe would speak and act as one in trade and represented by only one seat in most international fora. So in other words, uh, it would just be one head of state, one foreign office, one defense minister. This is, you know, federalization. Yeah. Uh, and a European defense union, union is created in cooperation with NATO, with the EU becoming a global leader on aid and trade. Uh, the Eurozone has much greater cooperation on fiscal, social and taxation matters. And David, frankly, of those five scenarios, everything that we have been talking about and everything that you have been talking about for the last, uh, well, couple of years, uh, suggests that number five is what we're going to get, uh, that Europe uh, speaks and acts as one. It becomes a federalized system uh, with a European Defence Union, a European Treasury, and it becomes a global leader for aid and trade. Completely correct. There'll, there'll only be one outcome here, you know, whatever he's, you know, he's horse trading and what he's saying there. The, the concept is is pretty straightforward. You know, it, it, it wanted currency union. It's got that. Uh, Britain's opted out of it. It wants military union. They're now using the word defence union. Now, they, they, they were very ginger about this. And it's some, you know, the, the phraseology is has altered uh, over the last six months since the cat's come out of the bag with this, since, you know, there's a few of us been pushing it. Um, who's to say it's been pushing it the hardest? I don't know. But there's a few of us been pushing this. And the military union, I'm going to use the original phrase, you know, as, as per Avril Harriman, you know, that he referred to it as that, so I'm going to refer to it as he referred to it. The military union will then beget the treasury and the treasury will then trigger it becoming a state. So the nation states will then lose their veto. Now, the, the mechanics of this, of course, is that in order for the euro to carry on as a currency and the, and the whole concept to carry on under that, it requires the military union. It's a vital component. And this is what was so upsetting during the Brexit campaign that, you know, no matter what we were saying to all these people that alleged they were Brexiteers, this is the key issue. Our military is a key issue and this issue for the, for the EU. And if you want to challenge it and you want to fight this, this is their Achilles heel. Now, despite all the efforts, you know, there are a few of us doing it. You guys there at UKC, Brian and Mike, all of you, us, um, you know, and slowly but surely a couple of other groups have appeared during the process. But they were refused to use the term military union because the one thing this isn't is an EU army because that implies ownership of, of the EU and the EU generated. It isn't. It's military union. They will take nation states into military union under Brussels control. So Brussels will call the shots. Brussels will have autonomy over the capital budgets, procurement budgets and the operational budgets. So this is the mechanics of it. They have to do this in order to carry on with the euro. Otherwise, the euro will default. It will be the biggest default in history. If they get it, the project will and the concept will carry on because they'll get their treasury and they'll become a state. Now, the thing is here, and this is where our ex-officers are now starting to realise this. Some MPs, I believe, are starting to realise this. And they're framing the target. They're, they're reusing the right terms of reference. They're seeing this for what this is. And this is vital for the debate now to come about. We as a nation, if we want to be a nation, cannot be in this arrangement militarily at all. And we cannot be putting money into it. Fair enough, we'll partner them at some stage. You know, people are saying this. I don't think that's, you know, that's probably, you know, not something that we can, you know, not debate. But in terms of our military being rolled into this, I am 100 percent with Maggie Thatcher on this. I didn't agree with everything Maggie did, some things she did very badly, but I'll agree with this. And, and I believe Admiral Woodward and, um, you know, his peers at the time when we had an active admiralty or, you know, a, an admiralty that wasn't moribund as it is now, theoretically. 
um, that, you know, it is, frankly, no, no, no. And this is what we've got to get down to, you know, and this is the danger we've got with Mike Fallon is that we get bounced into this because there's money going into it from the UK government. Yep, David. Money being to the European Defence Agency from Fallon. And we've got to stop it. That money has got to be redirected here into our industry and our military, not theirs. Yep. David, I will remind people that, of course, Mr. Fallon is a wolf in sheep's clothing because he was originally a driver of the European movement himself. So is he really for Britain coming out? I don't think so. And as you're saying, it's nothing to do with an EU army, despite everything that Theresa May says about Brexit. UK has been pulled into that um, European integrated military structure, complete with research and development and procurement. And of course, one of the things that's been uh, going on in the background to help drive this is attacks on uh, the ability of UK to produce its own military equipment. Uh, we've got a headline here that Boeing is crowing uh, because it's opening up a new UK site. 30 jobs, so don't get too excited. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is Boeing beginning to position itself, what, to hoover up British Aerospace, Rolls-Royce? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is this is what I mean, we're looking like BAE stocks in play here with this, you know, the general sort of framing of what's going on in all this. We're looking at huge defence spending being announced by the EU through Germany. The German defence minister has been reported um, over the last fortnight saying she's going to increase spending massively. I believe this is to drive the EU military union. Uh, Trump is saying he wants, you know, sales to go up and he wants people to buy military stuff and, and, and spend money with it. So, you know, regardless of whether that's under NATO or whatever, you know, that's the bottom line. But what we're seeing here really is, is we've got, we've got a real serious problem. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to agree with what I've heard from John Redwood. You know, our industry now is, is the key thing and what we're going to do best for our people and our jobs and our, and our engineering. Um, so from what I've heard from John Redwood recently on this, I agree with him absolutely, you know, 100% that we've got to think about what we're doing with what we're making. And that's the key thing, what we're making, because at the moment, BAE aren't making an aircraft, you know, and that's 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 the problem. That's what we've got to get to. So we can judge how effective the 57 Sandys bill here of going pan-European with this. Now, you know, what a what a BAE making? Because the, the problem is at the moment with all this defense spending, as I said, that's gonna go, go through uh, America and through uh, the European conglomerates is, is that BAE's position is currently vulnerable. And if that money sticks somewhere, there's a good chance it's going to get bought. You know, I know the government thinks it's got a golden share with this, but, you know, Ways and Means Act 1974, someone will find a way around of it and they'll find a way into it. So our government, if it wants to Brexit and, and do as it says, has got to do two things. Completely unravel from the uh, interoperability and the, the, the entanglements that we've now got with the EU military structure, and we've got to invest the money then in our own industry and our own companies and our own jobs and our own people and our nation. We can't be flowing it into another into another into another avenue. So, well done, John Redwood, for saying what he said. Um, you know, more please. I feel a bit like Oliver, if something sort of quite Dickensian here. You know, it's a bit like, can we have some more, please, sir? Okay, David. Thank you. Um, well, yesterday uh, we were mentioning the uh, new initiative from the government on internet safety for children. Uh, we mentioned uh, Karen Bradley's comments that the, the internet has introduced a host of new dangers uh, which children and parents have never faced before. Um, well, we're gonna solve that problem uh, by bringing sex education to four-year-olds uh, because that's the obvious thing to do. Uh, the Telegraph here reporting that ministers are set to announce plans for compulsory sex education lessons in schools for four-year-olds, children, as young as four will be given sex and relationship education to warn them about the dangers of the internet. Uh, this is under the plans which were announced yesterday uh, and that uh, teenagers will also be taught about how to protect themselves. Uh, so that, that's good. Uh, but we're going to start with uh, four year olds because that is the most appropriate age, Brian. Uh, I think not, but Indeed. that's what they're going to start with. Uh, well, we just end on this one. Uh, we've had information about this uh, mass resistance before. Um, they've been looking in a particular area, which is pornography being introduced into American schools. They've pointed a finger at a company, EBSCO, that essentially uh, provides data-based information into schools. And what uh, 
what's being said on this website in detail, including communications with this company, is that uh, youngsters were able to get through into hardcore pornography and despite protests from parents that this was completely wrong, uh, they say that uh, EBSCO did nothing and the schools did nothing. In fact, they say it was almost as if the schools wanted the children to have access to that pornography. Now, we did uh, ring the UK office of EBSCO before we went live. I haven't had a reply yet. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I spoke to a very nice lady who said they will come back to us. And we've asked them whether they can confirm that information being taken by UK schools is clean of pornography. But it seems to us that uh, if we follow everything through the government desperate to sexualise children, uh, then when children are sexually abused, we say, oh, well, the problem is that the children have had too much access to sex, uh, media clamp down. Meanwhile, the government is saying that paedophiles, child abusers who just look at uh, children being abused, uh, they really just need a bit of help. Mm. This is deliberate policy. David, 30 second closing comment on anything you like. Yeah, I don't like the sound of any of this. I just, I, I'm, you know, four year old with this sort of thing. Is that really, you know, is that really what we need to be doing? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, it, it just sort, it just seems completely the wrong alley of all the things that our government could be doing. Um, you know, I'm now saying sort of Justin Walker this morning. No, don't mention the money, you know, and all the other big issues or, you know, joint Franco-British nuclear deterrent. You know, we're, we're on this now. And it's like, you know, whatever's next, you know, we see this chaos within the NHS of I just, oh, you know, come it's on. A you know. it's, it's a mess. It's a total and utter mess. And yeah. I, it's a mess. It's chaos. It's a shambles. But we believe this is deliberately created. This is not just uh, ignorance and incompetence on the part of the government. But thank you for that. We'll we'll leave uh, we'll leave you there, and we'll close by saying a big thank you to all of our U.S. viewers and listeners. We understand that we're now getting quite a, a following in the state. So if you're watching us live, um, or if you're going to watch us later on. Uh, downloaded from the internet. Thank you for coming and joining UK Column. And I hope that you'll uh, pass us on to friends, family, colleagues, and whoever. And a final thank you to uh, those that are taking out subscriptions and donating. And uh, a very big thank you to the individual who uh, decided to take up um, a lifetime membership. So we will be communicating with that person, but thank you very mu much. It shows enormous con confidence in the quality of the work that uh, we're putting out. We'll end there. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.